hopefully these next few minutes will be showing you a few things that make your project move along easier and have a little more success. Um, the first tip is that if you're using a hammer, you want to use one that you're familiar with. It cuts down how much you hit the wrong things, including your fingers. Uh, the nails for the framing, just like the screws, are going to be two and a half to three inches long. So you want to be careful again uh, not to hit your fingers because it hurts. And then the nails for the plywood is anywhere from inch and a half to two inches long. So that would hold down through the thickness of the plywood and into the wood below. If you have a comfortable position, you might be able to take a pair of pliers and literally hold. Instead of with your fingers, the pliers you could be hitting. And if you miss, you hit the pliers. Something that I suggest especially uh, if you don't have a lot of experience. Uh, but then anyway, anyway, there are some positions where you're not going to be able to hold it very well with that and the wood. Uh, then there are, uh, are also options such as air nailing. And this particular one is a stapler. But there are straight nails and there are angled nails. Again, you want to use the same principle as the, the longer screws for the framing, the two and a half inch to three inch screws for the framing on your air nails, and it could be straight, these are angle nails, and the two inch, inch and a half on the plywood. Uh, there's a number of different brands. You can use any of those brands for nailing the plywood and nailing the, the uh, framing for the plywood. Then finally, my favorite, which is screws. Again, we're using the same length, two and a half to three inch. In this case, is uh, Phillips head. This is my favorite. Uh, three, two and a half to three inch for the framing, and inch and a half to uh, two inch for the plywood. Now, the reason I like the screws is because they don't move. Uh, it, it, you can pull the screws right on through the wood, but the screws don't move. Uh, whereas any of these can loosen up. And, but they're a very traditional thing that have been used for hundreds of years. Uh, uh, now, as to what kind of screw gun or screws, to, uh, drill or such, to use, I've used every kind, uh, right on up to big, big drills. And in this case, this is a battery powered drill, and you can put a shaft in it. This one has a, a, a keyless chuck, which means it doesn't have to have a tool to tighten it up. And then this is a battery, I mean a uh, electric um, drywall gun, which has a clutch in it. I've used these for years, hanging drywall. Uh, of course, that's electricity, but you can use a regular electric chucked screw gun. The problem with all the, the with both both of these that don't have impact, which is my favorite, the impact. The impact does something that these won't. And this is what I'm going to show you you have to do. When you are pushing in with that screw, can we zoom in here? Mm -hmm. You're pushing in and probably pushing as hard as you can. The torque of twisting that screw into that wood will literally lift out. It'll start lifting up it'll be lifting up and getting on top. And if you stay on it, you'll end up stripping the screw. And unless you can really push on and keep that screw down in the bottom, that tip down in the bottom of that screw, it will lift up. Now, how do you deal with that? Well, you've kind of what we call feather it in. That is, you take the trigger and you kind of push it in, let off, push it in, let off. And when you let off, that tip falls down into that screw head again and gets tight and you can push again. Feathering it, and, t and you're pushing hard the whole time. So that's the trick with regular drills. You're going to have to not count on being able to push it all the way in, but rather you may have to feather it in so that it falls back down in that screw. Whereas the impact makes you look so much better. That impact is literally hammering in, and it's not the same as the impact that's on a drill. 
This is an impact driver. It literally pushes that tip in constantly so that it, you don't have to feather it in. So whenever you start getting uh, this thing where it starts stripping, you don't need to keep trying to push it in. You need to back it out and put another one in because you're stripping out the head of the screw and it's only going to get worse as you go down. So with these tips, hopefully you can get through the project that I just showed you how uh, on putting the wood and plywood down on your ruined floor on a mobile home. Well, I wish you well. Hope everything works out well for you. And with all the practice that you get, you'll get better and better at it and have more and more successes. Until next time, see you later. Hello. Today we're going to show you how to repair your floor that might have gotten wet or any other kind of damage and you want to replace it. In this case, a tree came through the ceiling. We've already replaced the, the roof. We replaced the drywall and painted that. Uh, we removed the drywall where the drywall got damaged, but this is what we're going to show you today is how to replace this swelled up floor. Uh, first of all, there are a number of different ways to get started with a hole. Sometimes the hole's already there for somebody stepped on it, but in this case, there is no hole. And you can take a drill, you can drill a hole in order to get a sawzall along the edge. Now, this can, uh, what you can also do is use a very simple thing like a hammer. And get, the idea is not to get so close to the drywall where you start hitting things. You can get moved up to sawzall do that. So here's what we're going to do. Here's you can see the nails where the rafter is. And we're going to put a hole right here. Now, if you really don't have a sawzall and you're trying to get by on a budget, you can literally take out all that edge with a hammer and a chisel. Now the problem with quality on that is it, it will a lot of times kind of angle the edge. But we're still going to put some force in there. The next thing I'm going to do is use a saw. Again, when you have the wall in place, the sawzall is not going to want to try to get too close. So what we're going to do is run that sawzall at an angle. Also be careful that this sawzall is not going to be cutting into an electrical line or a water line. Because then you got another mess. So what you do is try to keep your, your sawzall kind of shallow. You don't cut all the way through and lose strength. So, see how I went over the top of that 2x6 without literally cutting through half of it with the length of that sawzall blade. And to demonstrate what you can also do with a hammer. Again, you got to keep off that wall, especially when it's been soft.
to the 2x6 itself, which both have, they go to the lengths of uh, gluing it to the 2x6 in addition to stapling and air nailing this particular board. Now the particle board, the reason that it deteriorates so uniquely is a water-based glue when they put it together. It's a bunch of chips of wood that are glued together. When that water gets on it, that stuff swells up in a larger size and there's no way that the same material that's on this floor will fit in the same space. So it starts bowling up. Sometimes larger than this. And that's why also that, that it starts crumbling. Now, a lot of times I've seen where people try to run three-quarter plywood over top of this particle board. And what it is is a temporary fix because what happens is underneath that board, that plywood they put over top of this, this continues to deteriorate. Little by little, that stuff starts crumbling, it gets worse and worse, it never stops, and eventually the plywood's sitting on nails. So no linoleum, no tile will ever be able to be secure so as not to make lines in it and cracking and eventually it'll fall through too because it's not sitting properly uh, so you need to take this plow this parka board all the way down and put plywood on that's what we're showing you today okay about 25 minutes has transpired there's just two of us there's not a crew that comes in if you notice my hands are dirty my clothes are dirty what we've done is Clean up along the outside edge. Now, the reason there's got a distance between here is what we're fixing to do is tilt these pieces, and I need I don't need this scraping against the wall. But on these two bys, you'll find that a lot of times there's uh, nails on the two, top of the two by sixes, and there's also glue, and you'll have to chisel it off. You can use a screwdriver if you don't have a chisel. I understand, you know, working on the budget. Um, the sawzall works really well, getting a clean edge. If it doesn't, again, the chisel can be what cleans it up here. What we're going to do next is, if you see it every so often, every two feet, is a floor joist. And you can tell what these floor joists are a lot of times by the nails that are shown in the floor. And what you do is you're going to be cutting in between them. And the reason is that way we can tilt it back and forth and work the nails and screws out. So what I'm going to do next is right where I'm at, I'm going to take this saw, which is set at about an inch and a half. If you set it the width of the, first of all, this particle board could be as much as an inch thick or more. Uh, secondly, you'll have lots of humps and sometimes at an inch and a half, you know, might not even be enough of an inch and a half. So, we're going to now take this saw and you're going to hear some noise and I'm going to run lengthways and then I'm going to show you what we do next. Now, there's sometimes you can cut the plastic 
and it will run all the water out and you can survive that way. Okay, next comes the precarious part. Hopefully you won't see me fall through the floor, but it has happened. Step on one side. Mind you, my door is over there, so I'm not starting over there where I have to go through too much. If you see how I tilted this floor up, section up in this case. Not always that way. If you notice right here, it's a floor vent. And uh, they'll run, the ductwork will run from one end of the, of the house to the other. It's usually aluminum. Sometimes it's not aluminum, sometimes it's fiberglass. But it usually has an aluminum plenum going up here, or a little box made out of metal. What I've done is pull the staples, which you can do with a screwdriver or a chisel or a pair of pliers, pull the staples out, and then folded these edges up so I don't literally pull everything loose on purpose out of the ductwork. And it's, you can still fix it, but it's another journey. What I'm going to do now is take break this piece right here so it doesn't catch on the metal box itself. Then I'm going to go back over here. This is where a seam is. It, they use a, in this case, there's lots of different ways. Now, mind you, part of the reason that I like to use the big pieces uh, to get them out when I carry them out, the larger pieces I can, it's less mess to carry. I mean, you do have to shove them, you have to pick up all this stuff eventually. So, you know, the larger the pieces, the better. Um, what I'm going to do is again, like I did over there, I'm going to cut down the middle in between the floor joists and then we're going to rock back and forth and loosen it up. So here we go. Right here, 
and connect it to the joist here. And I'm using an impact gun, which is available. Uh, you'll hear the chattering. What it does is it constantly pushes that screw tip down into that screw. And it helps you stay in it. Now you still may have to feather it in from time to time. You can use nails. You can use other uh, nail guns. You can use other screws. Uh, you can use electric drills and put the tips in. But this is a Phillips head tip with Phillips head screws and that's about three inches long. And I'm going to go in at an angle. with the same screws, toenail on them and screw them whichever way. You can use nails, I just like screws because they don't back out. Okay, all along the outside edge, we want to put two by material. It can be two by six, two by eight, two by ten, but that's awful expensive, two by ten is. And I'm going to again fasten it with the fasteners that I'm using, and this is a three inch screw with the impact gun. This gun also has a shaft that allows you to be uh, wobblier with your gun and it can actually guide that screw in. Quite handy. Now you want to be flush with the two to sixes over here so that you can have your plywood flush with the floor where it was. As you can tell, in the last hour we fastened all of these two bys in. Again, I can say it be any size two by two by eight, two by six, two by four along the edge, so that there is no way that this will give. Plus, it gives it added strength to the overall floor and to the mobile home, whatever you move it or whatever. So now that we've done that all the way around, if you'll pan a little bit, we fastened all the way around these two buys so that we're ready for plywood. What we're doing now, uh, what we're going to do now is put this plywood, if we measure it up against the center and center it, we'll push that over on that side, on the, on the floor joist itself. And then we're going to screw it off. And my goal is to put a screw every six inches along the edge. How's that look over there? It is riding on the edge and it's on the two by up there. Okay, so we can push it a little bit to make it fit. Is that what you're doing? No, no don't put your plywood. We're just going to move it forward with these wall ones back and forth. Okay. Now, what we're going to do next is screw every six inches along the edge. underneath it. 
That way that there is no movement from one piece of plywood to the other, one person steps up on it. And we tie it together, we don't end up with lines through the linoleum slash tile, and it will not move as much, or virtually none. Again, it makes it stronger. So to hold it in place, we're going to put a couple screws, and then we're going to put three-inch screws to hold it even better. Same with nails, you can do the same with a nail gun. Um, I cannot stress how important it is that screws don't move. In case you're wondering, the reason that I always run across the rafters, the floor joists, is because if you run with the floor joists, the, the way that the, the, the board is made and laminated, you end up with humps in between because the strength is running across. So you, the laminated areas are going this direction and the floor joists are going this way. That gives you that added strength. Whereas the, the companies that make these, a lot of times they, it's what's called railroading, and they run with the floor joists. That, happen, that happens a lot of times, even though it's done that way at the factory, you end up with bows in between because the strength is lost. Not much strength in particle board, and that's, again, why I use plywood. The next step from here uh, would be, to, as, we, as you've seen, we've screwed off everything all the way around. All the edges are all screwed. There's nothing going to move. All of the screws are made so that they go, that they go down. We'll have to go over it one more time and check, drive them down. What you need to do then, if you're going to put tile, which in this case is what we're going to do, is then you put floor level and you mix it like a uh, really thick uh, plastic-like consistency and you smooth out the edges. Transition is very, very small. So that way you, you won't show much of a hump. And again, you notice the joints in here are never in the same place from one row to the other. Staggered. Again, you won't see the, the humps in the floor because there's, the joints are staggered. If you put them all in one place, it will be an obvious line right straight through the roof. So what we do is stay away from putting the joints in the same place. And you go and put floor level on this if you're going to put tile. If you're just going to put carpet, you're ready to go. When you put the carpet on, then you're going to put tr you know, uh, trim. If you're Oh, your edges like this one are a little bit wide. What you can do is either put caulking in there or you can use spray foam and spray foam it. And then as it expands, and it will expand, you'll wipe it down. Keep it tight. Then whenever you put your floor covering on, whether it be carpet or tile, you'll be putting your trim, your floor trim or your baseboard on. So this is how you do your floor. Thank you for your time.